Evening all. I thought we'd continue looking at um, the Alekine versus Erva rematch of 1937. In this game, uh, looking in particular at the decisive games, uh, Max was playing white in, in game 17 against Alexander. And uh, we saw d4. Okay. d5. And we saw the ultra solid Slav defense. Knight f3, knight f6. Knight c3, and now Alexander took on c4. And sometimes this can be uh, very tricky um, taking on c4, giving White um, options to try and you know get this pawn back. But sometimes there's concessions in the process. Uh, let's see how White does this. First of all, he plays a4 to try and prevent b5 from Black. Uh, so now we see Bishop f5, e3. It's all fairly standard stuff. Uh, so far, e6, bishop takes c4, and black can often use this b4 square and uses it here with bishop b4. And um, we saw uh, last week a pretty crushing defeat of Alexander in this very, very, uh, in this very same variation, um, where I think knight e4 was played at some point quite early, but here it, it is a little bit different uh, when it is actually played. Both sides castle, queen e2. Essentially played in uh, this position, knight e4 here. Okay, so there's a big question here. Uh, well, first of all, why is black um, interested in doing this? If black doesn't block the e pawn, maybe like theory at the time was not as developed as nowadays, but white might be stretching out in the center with e4, liberating this bishop. Then e5 might be dangerous, driving away this knight from this defensive pawn, and all sorts of things could happen after that. Uh, so this e4 is seen as quite dangerous uh, as, as the perceived threat in the position. Uh, so possibly this, this helps explain why there's, there's this keenness to play knight e4. Uh, but white is trying to play dynamically here. So he doesn't just take on e4, which gives black a comfortable position. Uh, seemingly comfortable position, uh, you know. For example, knight takes, bishop takes. What does white actually do in this position? Uh, it seems fairly comfortable uh, for, for black. Uh, what white does is actually the dynamic move, bishop d3, and it's basically a pawn sacrifice uh, here. Okay, if if knight takes c3 or bishop c3, it looks as though white's uh, potentially losing. Uh, a pawn. Uh, well, in the game continuation, he's definitely losing a pawn because black plays bishop takes c3. And um, white's intention here is not uh, something like bishop e4, but just to take on c3 again, offering the c3 pawn. Uh, so you, you can see that this b file might be handy for white and this c file might be frontal pressure on c6. But it's not so clear right now. This can come apparent uh, potentially. Uh, so knight takes c3, grabbing that pawn, and we see queen c2. Okay, now if knight the knight goes back, then obviously bishop f5 is not desirable for black. So black takes on d3, and after queen takes d3, okay, so it's the case of material versus quality versus time. Has white generated enough quality and time here in, in relation to the material invested? So after knight d5, what, what is white's... Uh, what are white's trump cards here, for example? Well, also this bishop now has got this diagonal to attack that rook, which may or may not be useful, but uh, Max decided it was useful. Bishop a3, driving the rook to e8. Black doesn't want to <clears throat> give up the exchange. And now we see rook a v1. So the, the start of the frontal, you know, the pressure on the queen side here. How does black actually defend b7 without weakening c6 here? Difficult. He plays b6, and now we see after rook fc1. Problem with c6 is that this knight can't move now. So white seems to have a lot of pressure here. Furthermore, knight e5 is coming up to put more pressure on c6. Starts to look a little bit unpleasant. Black wants to be able to develop at some point, surely. The rook and knight here. Black plays a5, and we see knight e5, and there seems to be strong compensation uh, for the pawn. Um, I don't know what you guys think. Um, if you want to say, if you want to say your comment about the evaluation, or should we leave that a little bit later? 
I think we'll leave that a little bit later some questions here but white for me from my perspective it looks as though there's clear compensation for the pawn okay and white's not just going to get back the pawn often the case because he's got all his pieces uh, mobilized here uh, it's not just getting back the pawn but there's also further damage uh, to black's position uh, on the cards uh, potentially black plays knight b4 that just snapped off and now white regains the pawn with knight takes c6 black takes and after rook takes c6 well you might think uh, you know rook takes a4 but that might fall into queen b5 and then black's dropping b6 for example queen a rook b6 for example uh, possibly uh, so black actually decided in this position to play e5 so he's volunteering to go a pawn down now from being a pawn up he's now a pawn down uh, but he's trying to sort of get some peace play with like his rook uh, for example on e8 so we see rook takes b4 ed4 rook takes d4 unfortunately there's that poor weakness on b6 to try and exploit here okay that poor weakness queen b8 it doesn't look very nice for black uh, so from being a pawn up to being a pawn down with a miserable kind of position here quite passive devoid of counterplay maybe he wished at this point why didn't he play the king's engine defense well the king's engine defense was actually a uh, popular in later years the slav at the moment was the rage in 1937 as far as world championship mat matches either either the slav or the queen's gambit some variations of the queen's gambit were all the rage but okay so how does white attack b6 well he plays queen b5 it seems fairly sensible we see rook c8 okay a little trap if the rook moves or the queen takes we're going to get back row mated so leave some space for the king still put pressure on b6 now that's taken on c6 queen takes c6 we see h6 black also wants to avoid the back row issues we see rook b4 it's torture really the rook's driven to an unpleasant place queen b5 it's protected and now rook d4 white enjoys greater freedom with this rook compared to this rook and is also of course a pawn up queen c8 and we see uh, here rook e8 rook e4 pardon me with the threat of rook e8 check needs to be parried king h7 that does leave f7 a bit looser than usual we see now rook e7 going in for that f7 pawn the queen is attacked offering b6 here so black's trying to generate some counterplay alexander's trying to generate some counterplay can he do that here so he's offering b6 and what does he get he gets this check and now this kind of dangerous looking rook f5 not only protecting the f7 pawn but now f2 is unscrutinizing here now as long as the queen you know is is on is on a protective uh, diagonal then e4 could be a useful resource to try and defend f2 if that comes up as an issue so queen d4 keeps keeps an eye on f2 indirectly we see queen c2 directly attacking f2 and now this e4 resource attacking the rook and defending f2 the rook moves to f6 and we see e5 sorry no we don't see e5 and you might think why not e5 um, it might not do anything uh, that great uh, and also there's some nasty checks to consider like queen c6 check if e5 uh, so this could be problematic for white so actually he's got to be careful to leave that pawn at the moment perhaps on e4 here it does protect that diagonal uh, so white actually plays rook e5 which gives um, some options uh, some extra options clearly that for example a5 will be protected by the rook also rook f5 when this queen's not on there could be a useful resource for the moment rook c6 is played and we see a5 here queen e2 and it looks as though now there's a threat of rook c1 coming into f1 and this looks fairly dangerous but uh, max over is very cool like a cucumber here what he does is invites this seemingly aggressive uh, move and just calmly go for to win yet another pawn so he's already two pawns up 
Uh, but this A pawn is going to be uh, some while away, and Black's you know coming in with Rook and Queen. This Rook can't really help things. So what has he got up his sleeve? He plays Queen D5, just offering Black the option of this seemingly aggressive Rook C1, which is accepted. Okay, and now just Queen takes F7, not minding this seemingly scary check. That's used. And we see King F3. The checks, do they run out though? That's a key question sometimes. Do the checks run out? Queen d1 check, and we see King f4. And in fact, the checks are running out because of the check. King g4, how do they continue here? And now it's White's turn. If Black runs out of checks, then White has Queen f5, Rook e8 coming up, or Rook e7. So black actually are resigned in this position. So this was game 17. Max, you know, still, uh, you know, in fighting spirits in this match. Won game 17 in Slav defense. So Alexander did take some knocks in in this semi-Slav uh, variation. Uh, if we want to quickly just review the game, um, so pawn sacrifice dynamic. How many of us would use this? This is this seems like a very good idea in retrospect in this position. Bishop d3, pawn sacrifice. Okay, so um, it's accepted the pawn sacrifice, but it just came at some price that white seems to have uh, intuitively, you know, extra quality and time. So you know Kasparov's interrelationship material versus quality versus time is being demonstrated here. That it seems, you know, white with this diagonal and with the B and C files is getting um, quite a bargain for the pawn. Actually, black's lagging behind in development here. Uh, so we see bishop a3 and rook a b1, and there's pressure. Uh, enough pressure, it seems, on the queen side. And it's not just the case of getting the pawn back. There's the pieces are all ready to win more more material. They've, they've have a lust now for winning even more material. They're in a good position. And um, okay, so he goes a pawn up, and uh, shows fine technique after to sort of um, allow Black a little bit of counterplay. It seems, but it doesn't doesn't really uh, do anything too dangerous. These checks. Okay, so let's go on to the next uh, decisive game in the match. So. <clears throat> Game, uh, okay, so that was game 17. So let's have a look at game 21. So in game 21, okay, we see uh, Max playing white again. Uh, in Sorry, I'm not, I'm not showing each game in turn. This is the next decisive game. So in game 21, he was due for white again. So d4. After the night, now we see an interesting move. Thankfully, um, in terms of openings, uh, variety. It's always interesting in a particular World Championship match to see a variety of openings played. In that respect, the Fischer Spassky match actually of 1972 had loads of different openings. Here, thankfully, we are treated to a different system. Uh, we're actually treated to what turns out to be uh, not a Nimzo engine, but a Queen's engine. So Knight F3 played here. And Alexander Alokhine playing the Queen's Engine defense. So this looks very, very modern Queen's Engine defense with Bishop b4 check and the Bishop going back. Very, very modern check to disrupt White's uh, d4 control, d5 control. And the Bishop sometimes a bit silly on c3 as a target. Uh, it's all theory nowadays, knight e4 now, uh, to suppress perhaps White playing e4 at some point. Um, and also, it means if if this is taken, whenever this moves, you'd exchange off the light square bishops as well. White castled, black castled, and now actually we see d5. Okay, white's offering the dark square bishop, but in return has got extra space. So after knight takes d2, queen takes d2. Okay, the bishop pair versus the extra space. Who has the potentially more useful trump cards out of the opening here? Uh, so that's that's an interesting question to consider. Uh, 
Black's dark square bishop in particular might be useful at, at the moment. And he plays bishop f6. And already uh, there might be uh, a threat on indirectly on the d pawn, you know, taking and taking on d5. White doesn't want double pawns. So the d pawn's reinforced, uh, maybe against bishop c3, for example. We see d6. And interestingly, white decides here perhaps uh, slightly controversially uh, not to try and lock in this bishop you might consider a move like e4 to try and lock out that bishop but on the other hand that bishop could always you know after taking uh, use up this diagonal maybe uh, so it wouldn't be that bad it's not it's not so clear-cut but we see d takes e6 really inviting the bishop to have some play uh, but white has invite in mind perhaps the e6 pawn could be a target and immediately double attacks both b7 and e6 now okay we see bishop takes g2 king takes g2 so e6 is a little bit of a problem queen c8 and now again e6 is vit victimized with queen e3 now uh, alexander has a difficult decision uh, to make here if, if he ever plays e5 he's blocking in his own bishop and furthermore these knights could wreak havoc in his position actually after e5 um, so he doesn't particularly want to do that uh, he actually offers up his dark square bishop with bishop takes d4 at least now his trump cards at least still the the f file pressure could be useful uh, he's neutralized the d4 d5 square for the moment for this knight so the e6 pawn is, is not without uh, virtue rook takes d4 and we see knight c6 and now a uh, kind of artificial looking move rook e4 uh, where the rook does seem a little bit potentially misplaced here black's rooks on the other hand after rook f6 uh, well at the moment this needs to get into the game maybe on f8 to put some pressure on the f file but uh, in advance of any f file operations and to fix down try and fix down maybe e6 this move f4 is played and we see queen d7 as though black really wants to kind of maybe play for rook f8 anyway um but now okay maybe this is a slightly rash looking move in this position the move g4 is played uh, in principle it's it's creating a bit of a vacuum around the king here and the e6 pawn is automatically compensated by the f4 pawn now in variations coming up black seizes the opportunity for rook a f8 after g5 can now play rook f5 but not not too concerned about rook takes e6 here um and i think we should really uh, maybe check this out in the game h4 was played if white played rook takes e6 um okay so in this position well actually there's even a tactical move available uh to black which which may be interesting i'm looking at knight d4 but then rookie seven if i give everyone 20 seconds here what would you play as black would it be okay i'm not going to give any clues but what would you play here as black if white had played rook takes e6 i'll give you 20 seconds starting from now anyone actually yes there is a very good tactical resource which I believe has been pointed out someone on play chess so anyone on chit twitch awake on play chess god 1204 yes um, has pointed out a very interesting resource and now on on stream yeah 95 from clay Rab. I think you guys have a point here this rook e6 there's an interruption tactic knight e5 so we can't even take here because the rooks are dulled anyway and we've just blocked the uh, protection of the rook so that seemed big trouble uh, for white you can't do that 
So this means, all in all, that black does seem to have a great position now. White's voluntarily created weaknesses around his king, has got a backward pawn on a file which black has doubled rook. So black has really got the edge, I'd say, here. Okay, so much for that e6 being weak. Uh, white plays h4 here. Now we see queen f7. And again, uh, you know, that tactic uh, probably still exists here. Rook e6, knight e5. Um, so what about the f4 pawn? No. Okay, that, that's clung on to. Just rook f3. Okay, we see king h8. Queen d3. And now Alexander, in this position, plays a rather painful looking uh, move, actually. Uh, he plays d5, supported by the queen on f7 and the rook here, to play d5. This rook, which I mentioned looked a little bit on the artificial side earlier, uh, is, is a subject of attack here. And actually, sometimes you'll see game commentators say about a move looking artificial, and sometimes in that very game, there is often a punishment of an artificial looking move using tempo gaining moves to exploit it. Um, artificially placed pieces are often subject to tempo gainers. When computers play artificial moves, of course, it's all tactically justified to a certain depth. But here, that artificial rook in the center is unfortunately, it's, it's looking pretty uh, grim here after d5. Pretty grim indeed. We see uh, white now not playing actually uh, trying to escape with the rook to a4 and that would be interesting to consider here why can't white play c takes um, is there an immediate uh, problem here um, for example okay 95 doesn't seem to work at all but ed now let's say the rook uh, stumbled to e3 then i think we have d4 but uh, let's say the rook went to a4 is this uh, necessarily a disaster uh, for white? I'd say maybe it is actually a disaster for white in this position. Uh, can you spot what black could play in this position if I give you 20 seconds starting from now? Anyone? What would be a good move for black? I think I spotted a good move for black. I, what would you play here? Okay, yeah. Clay Rab, yeah, I think d4. I'd go with d4. Even against, uh, sorry, pardon me, even against rook a4, I think the move d4. Because we have got tre this treble pressure on f4 here. So say knight e4, we, I'm sure we can just take on f4 here. So this is pretty nasty stuff. So this is a bad position perhaps for white. And Max plays in this position actually, uh, rook takes e6. <clears throat> so he's maybe looking forward to queen takes e6, c takes d5 with maybe some compensation um, going on there okay possibly but the way Alexander plays this from here is not simply take on e6 but inserts knight b4 attacking white's queen leaving the rook uh, to be taken soon if needed queen e3 protecting the rook for a moment now we see knight c2 the queen is being dragged away from protecting the rook. So black is winning the exchange maybe more comfortably than the intended way of winning the exchange. Um, sorry, there was a question. What about e5 after e takes d? Now let's just quickly look at that. So e5 after, oh, I'm not sure I can look at that. Okay, pardon me. Let's, let's just go with the, that game continuation here. So black's winning the exchange. Uh, and now, okay, queen f7 is back on f4 as well. 
So it's not just blacks the exchange up, he's winning f4. This is a real pain. This is an absolute pain for white. He's surely not going to last too many moves from here. Queen d3, queen h5, black's just materially uh, up with still pressure. Uh, pressure h4 is dropping. Look at this vacuum, it's pretty horrendous. Queen h3, little cheapo set. Okay, queen c8, so that's parried with check, blocking that diagonal. After king f2, h6, rather elegantly putting more pressure on white, and white would end up losing uh, potentially the queen here. Uh, for example, taking, well, white resigned in this position, but say, you know, he took check, we win the queen, you know, king here, qu we win the queen. Uh, so that queen's loose on h3 here. This is pretty nasty and white resigned there. So that was a bit strange how white ran into difficulties. If we do a quick uh, review of that game, it seemed the, you know, the artificial rook move was punished after all. At some point, uh, white's artificial looking rook move, rook e4. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if the rook had gone, to, remained on d file, this structure might be surprisingly solid because uh, d6 is well supported here it's not as though d6 is that loose and black might even consider you know this diagonal and the f file anyway you know doubling up later so i think black all in all had a comfortable position even at this point so rook e4 okay it's a target later um but uh it was very resourcefully played but this is a bit of a loose thing move g4 uh here probably didn't help white's cause too much uh, the, but the rook, you know, not being able to reverse, you know, is, is always a bit of a concern. You know, artificial looking rook here, can't easily reverse, stuck there. It's just asking for tactics later, perhaps. Um, so we've, we're also asking for more tactics with this vacuum. Black's coordinated uh, pieces working well as a team. And this, this, this rook e6 now just failing tactically, it seems, the knight e5. So this, this battery here seems fairly harmless on e6. So uh, we see white's uh, position becoming pretty bad now after this trebling. Black's also threatening um, potentially e5 here in any case because uh, this rook's loose on f1. You know if ever take we just take here. Uh, so e5 might be a threat as well which rook f3 might have been designed against e5 because at least the rook's supported by the pawn. On the other hand now, you know, again, after king h8, you know, this, this rook just seems badly placed in this position. And it's it's exploited um, now. Uh, I'm not sure the immediate threat actually of king h8. It's very dangerous uh, when annotating games to assign uh, moves as quiet waiting moves, when there's often uh, very specific, uh, you know, tactical motives associated with them. Um, if anyone knows the very specific idea of King H8, well, you know, what comes up is D5. Okay, so maybe, uh, what you know, why not, okay, we can ask the question, why not uh, D5 uh, here immediately uh, in this position? Was D5 playable instead of King H8? That, that might be interesting to ask. Um, does anyone have that seems good here as well to be honest uh, initially does anyone have um, an idea about d5 here uh, it looks good as well here uh, maybe it's, it's been pedantic um, to try and work this out but uh, king, king h8 was well if, if you do have an idea about king h8 please call it out um, well, okay, if, if if d5 was played immediately, rook takes e6. Um, well, we'd have d4 straight off the bat in this position. Even worse. So, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe just white was in difficulty and king h8. Um, okay, was thrown in for a particular reason, I'm sure. But d5 remains uh, a threat here, a constant threat. So queen um, d3 uh, runs into d5 anyway. He just ends up winning the exchange out of this um, in his on his own terms with knight b4. 
So he won the exchange on his own terms and, and still it remained that F4 pawn was dropping off as well. So quite a vicious game from Alexander Alekhine, uh in this game. Uh, so White resigning pretty shortly now. Okay, he could have, well after H6, White resigned. So okay, um, so let's go on to the next decisive game of this match. Uh, so this was game 22 now. The very next game was a decisive game. Game 22. So we saw in game 22, Alexander playing white. And this is really interesting openings now. Actually, we saw from an earlier Alexander Alakai match against Bozjolodzhabov, who my good friend Paul Georgia was trying to help me pronounce for a while over the weekend. Bozjolodzhabo. Anyway, forget that. Uh, so anyway, there was an interesting variety of openings in, in that match against Bogo, for sure. But here we see Alexander returning to those old ways with knight f3. So he's playing white. And now up to d5, he plays very hypermodern c4. Now, from the evolution of style perspective, Alexander Alekhine is sometimes grouped in the hypermodern group. He was a representative of the hypermoderns' ideas, and part of their ideology was the idea of attacking the center, letting black, you know, letting the opponent rather occupy the center to try and attack it later. And we see it finally in game 22, a hypermodern approach here. And black goes for d4, so we have kind of uh, a, a reverse Benoni type position, modern Benoni. Um, it was the, the match uh, duration. Uh, there was a particular rule on the match um, of a certain to get a certain score. Uh, as it turned out, it, it wasn't too many games after this. So um, here, e3 was played, and actually Black plays instead of c5. Black played actually knight c6. So was white going to get a good position out of this opening? He played e takes d4. Okay, knight takes d4. So an interesting position. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4. Okay, is white doing okay? Knight c3. If the queen uh, can be evicted at some point, then white could take over the center here with two pawns neatly in the center. Knight f6, d3, which makes way for bishop e3 to kick this queen if needed. But also the queen's potential liability to knight b5 at some point, perhaps. This next move, c6, rules out knight b5s anyway. And the queen is kicked to a bishop e3. We see queen d7, which looks a bit on the artificial side again. Is the queen going to have to go here at some point anyway? Just want to park there. d4, and we see black now playing g6. Bishop e2, bishop g7, h3. The problem is with black's position, any c5 seems more than harmless here because white can always play, well, either taking even or d5 with a very comfortable looking position. So white here, for me, looks more than comfortable, actually, uh, this resulting position. Because also, if you look at this bishop on c8, uh, this bishop could be quality-wise quite good on this diagonal as well coming up and in fact after b6 we we start to see that immediately bishop f3 and it looks as though you know d5 is also a threat to consider uh, bishop b7 white now plays a4 actually making way for the possibility also about a5 to maybe inflict some structural damage on black and actually after rook a d8 does play a5 and he's extending the scope of the rook, of course, in its default square. Queen c7, and we see queen b3, putting the you know the pressure on on the queen side here, because potential d5s are also going to pressurize b6 here. Black now plays maybe against you know potential b6 problems. Knight d7, a b a b, rook a7, pinning the, the bishop. Uh, so it looks it looks fairly unpleasant. Uh, this position already especially with d5 you know if c5 we have d6 you know this bishop uh, is going to be a problem potentially uh, so black tries to get rid of that rook rook a8 it's reinforced uh, and now we see e6 trying to put the brakes on d5 against white playing d5 perhaps okay so here 
Alexander just takes on a8 and um, we see now uh, that this might be uncomfortable t uh, tactically uh, the way black takes here is bishop takes a8 and I just wonder if the routine looking rook takes a8 would fall victim to something like rook takes and queen a3 double attacking um, the bishop and also coming in potentially to e7 uh, for example like this would be uh, potentially I don't know something to, to worry about uh, so the way uh, the recapture was actually carried out uh, with the bishop here and then we saw d5 okay so blacks under real pressure he takes on d5 c takes d5 and at least makes use of that c5 square but goes into a pin here queen c4 we see ed bishop takes d5 okay white's lost the bishop pair but he's putting a lot of pressure on b6 now is he going to win a pawn or is he going to counterattack on b2 in this position that's protected so b6 and c5 look quite fragile here white's knight on d5 is also quite impressive black played knight a4 trying to deflect away the queen from d5 and attack b2 again b3 knight b2 queen moves b5 okay so what is going on here white plays bishop f4 and we see queen e6 and that pawn is now taken so he's a pawn up did could he could he have avoided the pawn being taken it seems a bit shaky that pawn if the pawn has been taken immediately actually instead of this bishop f4 move if the pawn had been taken immediately um maybe you know this this pin uh is potentially useful for rook d8 uh as an example that that might be unpleasant because the knight's covering d1 here so i think this might this might be an unpleasant position uh for white so alexander has avoided that by playing bishop f4 okay now it's only now you know he, he takes on b5 without any pin queen e4 attacking the rook the rook moves knight d3 attacking the rook again and here um, queen c4 we see queen e2 and now f2 needs to be protected rook f1 so white's emerged a clear pawn up is it going to be enough to win in this position black takes on f4 not, uh, and we see queen takes f4 the b3 pawn is attacked it's protected it's attacked it's protected queen a6 and uh, in this position we see rook d1 again the pawns attacked and protected rooks attacked it's protected bishop d4 attacking f2 okay now um, in this position we see now rook f1 with the bishop now loose uh, queen protects the bishop so still b3 is a persistent problem it seems check though now introduces a fork into the position knight c6 quite menacing it seems but black has a very cheeky resource which probably had to be factored in to playing knight c6 black played bishop takes f2 check very cheeky resource here uh, because if white just plays rook takes f2 then there's queen c1 check uh, double attack on on king and the knight on c6 and that will be equal on pawns so alexander though he does something uh, really clever if, if this was all part of his plan uh, just just to play king h2 rather casually uh, so there's no queen e5 check here this knight's covering the e5 square and this bishop's a bit of a liability for that f file so what we see here is um, rook e8 queen f3 and the bishop dare not move without being mated now so even though it's equal on on material now uh, you know white's got pressure he's he's turned his material into quality and time again uh, so he's got the dynamic you know pressure here one could say um, black's having to defend now and play artificial looking moves potentially so rook e2 but this bishop doesn't seem too healthy stuck on f2 trying to protect f7 and we see knight d4 a queen can't take without losing the rook 
bishop can't take without being mated on f7. So rook d2 and now we see check. And rather remarkably, uh, this knight's being a real torturer here after king e7. The knight comes to f4 now. And if the bishop like moves, then we've still got knight d5 check and then f7 would still drop. So this bishop really can't move that easily. Uh, we see now queen d4. Okay, and uh, now uh, white frees up uh, some resources here by playing, uh, well in this position, he wants to rule out checks on this diagonal. He can't play king h1. And this basically uh, means uh, in this position that uh, even if the bishop uh, moves now to say h4 or, or e3, although there's no knight d5 check, there is knight e2 uh, still attacking f7. So this bishop can't really freely move in this position, uh, it would seem. You know, for example, bishop h4, we just play knight e2. It's a real pain, uh, this position, or it might be. Or even worse, uh, there might be some other possibilities um, as well. But that looks looks fairly dangerous. Uh, but anyway, King King H one, Max played now Rook A two, and we see Knight E two interrupting the protection uh, from the Rook. It's it's quite a delicate tactical series of blows and counter blows here, uh, and against this Black plays Rook A one, pinning the Rook. White plays Check. And actually, it's safe to take d4 here, take the queen. So black has been tactically outdone. Uh, he wins that rook, but now these checks um, just run out uh, because in this position, okay, if, um, well, if if king, king g4 is, is, is not needed, uh, white can actually play uh, King f3 he doesn't mind giving up the knight to the check. King e4, the queen is perhaps too much for the rook and bishop because we've also got this outside pass pawn. Okay, so this is quite a difficult position after all that. Uh, rook d1, queen d5. Threatening actually just, just the take and the pass pawn would win even though it's equal on pawns. The outside pass pawn would be a winning distraction here, uh, potentially. Uh, King e7. But uh, actually, you've got to factor in how how quickly th this this king can hold this pawn. So maybe not here. It's no good. White well, should just carry on with 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 uh, trying to arrange some support for the queen. So he does that here with g4. Okay, we see h5. G takes h5. F5 check. King goes to f3. Check. King goes to e2. Check. After King D2, Rook E4, or HG, Black's Black's just obliterated now. He can't can't hold this. Um, so actually, that was a really complex game. Uh, just giving for it, just to get a gist of it, really. But very complex uh, set of of tactical um, moves there. Uh, but it seems the gist of it was that Alexander gave back the pawn to create a lot of problems on that F file. Um, Okay, so uh, qu quite a long involved game that one. Um, should we just go on to the next game, or does anyone want a review of this particular game? Uh, if I give you a few seconds to think about that, do you, do you want to review this game, or should we just go on to? Uh, there's there's two other decisive games potentially I was going to show in this session. This was quite a heavy one. We can go on to another one. Okay, let's go on to the one. So in game 24, we're approaching the end of the match actually. So game 24, in game 24, Alexander playing <clears throat> white, plays knight f3, and we see c4, e6, d4, 
uh, and a sort of uh, Tarash, Tarash variation. So C takes D5, but black didn't play E D5. He plays actually knight takes D5. So Alexander playing white, he plays uh, now G3. Okay, and we see C takes D4. Knight takes D5, queen takes D5. And white doesn't mind the exchange of queens here. He's got a little bit of an edge, perhaps, and he feels, even though it's a symmetrical pawn structure, he plays queen takes D4 which looks a little bit on the dull side, but white does have a slight edge. So the queens come off. Check, bishop d2, and a couple of bishops come off. Would you play this as white? Does white have anything here? Well, this bishop's likely to be slightly better than this bishop. Um, white's likely prospects of getting the rooks out are gonna be faster than black's rooks, slightly. But what about the king position? That's also interesting. Can the king actually be useful in the center here? Well, actually, uh, Max decides his king might also be useful in the center and plays king e7. Doesn't want to put it on g8 necessarily in this position. Bishop g2, rook d8, and we see king e3. So both kings are kept in the center. But white does seem to have a clear edge. Look at this pressure, this knight seems happy. The bishop seems happy here and the rooks are connected already. Black's rooks are a little bit away from being connected at the moment. Black can't do the natural knight c6 without shedding material, lots of material, because bishop takes c6 is a check and we win the exchange. So knight a6. Is this knight restrictable though? Is this another major problem in black's position here already? Even though the symmetrical pawn structure might indicate the probability of a draw fundamentally. The pieces uh, seem much better for white in this position. Um, so black is groveling a bit here with rook b8 and this knight is victimized now with a3. So the squares have been taken away from the poor knight. No squares for the knight, whilst this knight is as happy as a Happy parrot perched there, right in the center. So bishop d7, and we see f4, keeping the perch stable against any e5s. f6, and there's some weaknesses introduced here, actually. This h7 might be a little bit of a problem now that this pawn has moved. Might be more difficult at some point to defend h7. And Alagine eyes h7 with some scrutiny now, scrutiny with bishop e4. If black ever plays f5, then we get this beautiful e5 square. We just retreat the bishop somewhere, and then we can reroute the knight to e5. So, wouldn't play f5 in a hurry in this position. And um, black's got quite a miserable position, actually. Uh, so, the question uh, it, it is though, black played uh, bishop. Uh, e8 here. Okay, this taking this pawn seems a bit on the dodgy side, as though the bishop's going to be trapped to something like g6. Uh, Alexander just carries on restricting this knight. He's removing counterplay from black. He's got a beautiful central position with these three pieces, and this knight's kind of still not got any squares. Okay, furthermore. Uh, White is also threatening potentially f5. Okay, so rook d7, and in fact f5 is played, which gives the knight that even more impressive e6 square potentially. But this this I, this move had the intention also of knight c7, which is played. But now this 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 pawn is still vulnerable here for white trying to win a pawn without necessarily the bishop being trapped. So a price is being played, uh, paid for rerouting this knight even to c7 here. White now just takes on e6, takes on e6 again, and now safely can take on h7 because the bishop's not trappable really. It can come to g8 with check, escape along this diagonal. Okay, so we see f5, white's a pawn up. Can he convert this? Rook c5 attacking f5, g6, and we see this check. So a pawn up. Rooks doubled on the C file. Check, 
bishop c6. On the other hand, at least black hasn't got a problem piece now, but he is a solid pawn down. Can white really turn this into a win? Well, bishop d5, going wanting to go perhaps into the, just the purest uh, rook and pawn ending. Uh, rook e1, now the bishops come off. So, is white really winning this with this extra pawn here? Slight it's lack of symmetry here. Um, okay, so we see g5, check. Rooks supporting each other, g4, which does suppress the h2 pawn. Okay, and maybe, you know, black might be thinking of h2 later. But check, check. And here we see king e3. And this looks as though uh, if black's not careful, there's going to be a mate here. Embarrassing. So he's got to be careful about his king now. He plays rook e6 to give the king, for example, f6. Now, check, king f6. But this gives the white king f4. Um, and this would be mate, but unfortunately the rook's pinned to the king. Okay, so we see king g6 instead. One pair of rooks come off. Okay. Now in this position, white plays quite a powerful move in this rook and pawn ending. Sometimes it's important not to naturally, uh, I say naturally, not to automatically uh, capture material when you can win that same material in a less controversial way. So what would you play here actually? This is a key move I think to winning this position. What would you play here if I give you 20 seconds starting from now? So white's play. <laughs> hey, someone did a joke there, Lidad. That's very funny, very funny. So the joke made was e3. That would fall victim to rookie three. Sorry, not rookie three, rookie four. Isn't that mate? That's not the best way to play this rook and pawn ending. <laughs> yeah, very good one. You you were joking, weren't you? <laughs> That's good. But rook takes f5 is just uh, giving black some play, surely, with rook e2, uh, you know, on h2, okay? So you suppress the counterplay. You try and win f5, but less controversially with rook e5. You don't mind the king and pawn ending here because you're a pawn up. And now you could take, once the rook's evicted from there, now here, rook takes f5, g falls dropping, potentially. But even here, even here, after rook takes a3, uh, the tendency might be to snap the material very eagerly in this position with king takes g4 and i haven't i haven't engine checked this but um is there a better move in your opinion than king takes g4 here if i gave you 20 seconds here would you automatically snap this pawn or would you do something else if i gave you 20 seconds starting from now Oh, okay, um, I think, okay, there's been a suggestion um, of of rook a5, and I think that might be slightly on the controversial side, you know, because black does have a two to one pawn majority. So say, you know, black took and played b5. Couldn't we run into trouble here? I think we might be running into trouble if we do that. uh that that this looks like it's it's uh you know the king can't get back 
in time or can it no nope, can actually no problem all right still <laughs> just 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 wondering okay so rook a5 might have been playable but actually rook b5 was played okay and after b6 uh even less controversial to say on g4 black resigned okay the, maybe the nuances weren't amazingly important but it's, it's interesting to note them um, that uh, Alexander is not automatically taking material and we see that trait for example in in like Aronian in a recent tournament you know there was there were times he could have won material but he delayed it and he, he won material less controversially uh, so let's let's go and look at the the last game of the match so Alakine really in the lead and he needed just one more win to really secure the match in the last game of the match uh, he was playing black Okay, so Alexander playing black. Max kicked off with d4, and we saw an Imzo engine. And I think chess uh, chess games come label this as the Rozevsky variation coming up with knight g e2. So it blocks in this uh, Rozevsky blocks in the bishop for a moment. d5. One plays a3. He wants to avoid structural damage. Connect the bishop here, but black just retreats the e7 here. C takes E takes Knight G3. Alexander plays C5. Okay, Max plays D takes C5, isolating the Queen's pawn. Bishop takes C5. And if only White could get a grip on the dark squares here, and so he plays B4, which seems natural enough. You know, you might want to follow a Bishop B2. And with a blockade to follow, you know, like well, like knight b5 to d4, for example, later a nice dark square grip. But uh, the plans are cut through now uh, of all this. If I remove the arrows, actually in this position, Alexander cuts through these kind of grip plans. He avoids this grip. He plays an energetic move in this position. He plays d4. Okay, so what is going on here after d4? Well, clearly white doesn't want to want to take on d4. Surely that's that's just far too dangerous. He takes on c5, and we see d takes c3. And this looks a little bit problematic. In the game, white played queen c2. Now, if he had played queen takes d8, I wonder exactly why this could be problematic. Uh, this this position here. Let, let's say uh, bishop e2. You know, maybe just knight knight d2 is good. Knight knight d7. And black's got a comfortable um, position. This bishop seems hemmed in by that pawn. And you know, once black plays knight takes c5, it looks as though this could be quite unpleasant. So actually, white tried um, queen c2, which has its own issues associated with it. Alexander plays queen a5. Okay. And uh, we see Rook. <laughs> uh, I, I think White might be in, in trouble now after Rook b1 because we see um, the move Bishop d7, which introduces this resource Bishop a4, which is actually quite painful. It's difficult to try and surround this pawn now with Rook b3 without losing the exchange. And if White doesn't try Rook b3, then you know Bishop a4 is, is quite painful. You know, say bishop e2, then bishop a4. What are we doing? We're going to have to move out the way, and then c2 is actually winning the rook here anyway. Uh, so the idea of rook b1 was to surround the pawn. So you might wonder, well, wasn't there anything else instead of rook b1 here? It it seems it seems unpleasant. Uh, you know, say bishop e2. Maybe you know black just plays knight d7 again, for example. 
So perhaps something has gone wrong in the opening. Uh, because in the game continuation, this seems highly unpleasant that white plays this rook b3, allowing this skewer. So losing the exchange, it seems. Uh, but or did he miscalculate this? Because there's something quite subtle about this that the skewer is unskewered here with with queen takes c3 and it's probably a miscalculation because now can you see the move black played rather cheeky if I give you 20 seconds starting from now was Alexander actually outwitted tactically or not so 20 seconds starting from now what does black play in this position Anyone? Black to play? Nope. 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 Knight C6. Suggestions on stream Knight C6 from free people, not Knight C6. This is going to be a tricky one to find. Maybe you might not consider this as a, a move. Maybe it might seem absurd. No one can see it. That's that's fascinating. So I'm going to have to show it on, on streaming. No one can see it um, on HS. You have you have the score, and it, it is the move. It is the move Queen D8? Look at that D1 square. Cheapo time. <laughs> if the rook moves, we just get mated. Whoops. Ouch. <laughs> it's winning the exchange. Uh, so, Alexander just won this exchange from the opening at move 15. He's winning the exchange. So we see bishop c4. Knight a6 taking his time to win the exchange. The rook still can't move. White takes on a6, takes on a6. So white's just going the exchange down. He's accepting the exchange down. For what exactly? For a pawn. Not much. Okay, so we see queen d5, e4, queen b3. Queen b5. These pawns are also a bit loose, uh, so c5 is dropping off. Not even a pawn now, just purely, purely the exchange down. But there's some tenacious stuff we're about to see after knight f5. Uh, this knight's a bit dangerous on g7. Uh, there's potential threats to factor in on g7. Okay, and this bishop seems quite dangerous. Not all over yet. So rook b1, queen f4, frets, for example, queen g5. Alexander now does a tactic. Knight takes e4 to deflect away from c1. He's eyeing c1 here. Okay, was that a brutal tactic? h4, rook e8. It seems to be going his way even more. He's now a pawn up as well as the exchange up. Rook e1, queen c3, rook d1, and then we see knight d2. Okay, this poor bishop is now victimized. Rook takes d2, uh, that's taken, king h2, queen c7, rook d6. And we see rook c5 with a concrete threat now. Rook takes and then queen takes d6. Okay, but with his next move, g3, white is also setting a very clever. Um... <laughs> white setting a very clever little trap here. Uh, Alexander Alakon, you'll be shocked what he played in this position.
So guess what Alexander played in this position if I give you 20 seconds starting from now. I don't think anyone on stream will guess black's next move. You would need to know what the hidden threat is to be able to guess the move really. So black to play. So two is saying rook takes f5. See that's very interesting. You can be resourceful in chess up to a certain level, but you know sometimes there's there's really uh, terrible counter resources in chess, making it a really brutal game, much more than you'd think. So although rook takes f5 looks like a useful resource, there's a, there's a very very brutal counter resource. If I quickly show you this, um, so if rook takes f5 have been played, what does white have in this position? Which g3 had assisted. g3 had an interesting point to it. White to play in this position. What would you play as white if I gave you 20 seconds here? Anyone? No one can see this at the moment. Nope, it's not rook d8. It's not rook d8. No, on on play chess. You just be a rook down on rook d8. Anyone? It's not queen a4. No, you just take on d6. To check. You go queen f8. It's not queen a4. You can't play queen a4. No one. Someone. Well done. Rookie six. Actually, I saw this in the comments on on chess games, Colmar, which helps engine checking. <laughs> Just look at the comments. Um, and Alakine actually, I think, gave a lot of credit to Max Over for the tenacious resources he'd introduced here. Rookie six kind of would hold the balance if this was the position. Um, and Alexandra had seen this resource, so believe it or not, uh, you know what? What do we do here? We're just we're just going to end up in this um, position, which isn't good. Yeah. So the move Alexander played, you might think is a misprint. Why on earth would he play this move? After g3, that's cutting out the checks. It's securing the king. And what Alexander played in this position was actually rook f8. How could you arrive at rook f8? No one could arrive at rook f8 because you can't see the hidden threat. Alexander could, though. So now he's secured his back row. He secured the back row. So rook takes f5 is now on. So the game progresses, uh, continues. g4, taking time to support the knight, giving the option of g takes f5 to rook f5. f6. King h3. We see the undermining move h5 quite brutal. Under trying to undermine, you know, for rook takes f5 again. Queen d2. White's crumbling, starting to crumble. H takes g4. King takes g4. Queen f7. We see h5 at least stopping uh, the use of uh, the g6 square. And actually here, um, Alexander cashes in a bit for a bit of the material versus quality versus time. He actually sacrifices back now the exchange. He plays rook takes f5, sacrificing back the exchange. He's going to get a few pawns for it and the king's going to be kicked around, so it's all good fun. So king takes f5, check, 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 check. Taking another pawn. That's clear enough. Max has had enough. He resigns here. 
Well, yeah, both both of the players are very obviously very very good uh, tactically, but Alexander towards in the last few games really showed he was a bit more cunning of a fox than Max was. Both cunning foxes tactically. Okay, I hope you got something from this week. Um, I'll upload to YouTube comments or questions on YouTube when I upload it there. Thanks very much. See you next week.